Hi, Michelle Greenwell with Dance Debut, and I'm back here again with Matt Smoline from Limerick University. And uh, we've been chatting a little bit about classroom styles and teaching and what it means as a dancer. And uh, we thought maybe we'd share some of those reflections with you so you could think about them as well. So welcome, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, I think now when you're sitting in the well, it's not just because of the coronavirus where you find that you have extra time to reflect on life and experience. Uh, I've been doing this for the last number of years and it, some of these thoughts that I'm going to share was crystallized staying with yourself, Michelle, uh, for my sabbatical leave in 2017 uh, when I spent a fair amount of time in your studio exploring some, some steps and thinking about how you, you teach. Um, as my main style of dance is Cape Breton step dance and forms of Scottish step dance, uh, but I work at a university in uh, Ireland at the University of Limerick and my students are Irish dancers predominantly. Most of them are competitive dancers, but uh, there are a few Shannos ones who are coming in. I've started to observe how differently they have been taught and how they're learning in the kind of third level uh, environment and also reflecting on the whole idea of workshops versus regular weekly classes, uh, short intensive bursts of learning and the more sort of regular slow paced learning and whether it's for a goal of just learning to dance because you love to, to dance or whether it is because you want to win a competition or some other goal. And one thing I've often thought about is that you see people who, uh, as I worked as a dance uh, teacher in Scotland for over 10 years and pushing, I uh, was part of what they call the revived step dance, Cape Breton step dancing coming in with Cape Bretoners being invited over to Scotland to teach and then local dancers uh, being uh, keen on picking it up. Uh, some of them, including myself, would go to Cape Breton and try and figure out how it fits in contextually and socially and musically. Uh, while others, I would say, picked up whatever they got in a week's long course or a weekend course and then went off and started teaching and what you found quite quickly was observing students of all of us was that some of them had more of a sense of where the dancing sat culturally and how it sits in the music while others I would call were more mechanical and not necessarily sitting in the music at all not rhythmically so I started kind of challenging how much information can you pick up uh, in a workshop. Let's say that you have a masterclass that lasts a day, so six, seven hours, or if you go to a, a weekend school, so you have maybe Friday evening to Sunday lunchtime uh, of exposure to something. So let's say you're learning Cape Breton step dance or any other form as well. and I would say that there is, a, there is a kind of underlying pressure on the teacher to produce quantity over quality uh, in, in a way that you are, feel that, okay, you have to teach them 20 steps, otherwise they're going to complain that they didn't get something new out of it, rather than concentrate on a few basic movements to get everybody in the groove and really understand how to move to the music. Uh, and then if you have that really grounded in your body, embodied, um, you can pick up any step after that. So it's a kind of different uh, priority. And when I started teaching myself, I just did the usual thing. You stand in front of the class and you break the steps down very slowly often without any music, you might use counting or you make up word sequences. But when you were doing that in Scotland, 
the re there was no reference point necessarily for the students that you were teaching to the music they were going to dance to. They didn't have that knowledge of being surrounded by a certain soundscape of music to the point where they could pick up a, a movement and just internally go, oh, this fits to this type of music, whether it's a reel or a jig or a strats or whatever it may be. Uh, you were teaching, and I wasn't realizing it at the time, more in a vacuum. You kind of, you give them the mechanics and you can get quite far in that, but it still lacks that fluidity and the pulse and the energy that you see really good step dancers in any tradition, whether they're Chanos or Quebecois or Cape Breton or you name it. Um, and I started kind of thinking, how, how do we bridge this gap of uh, awareness? And it wasn't until we got dedicated uh, students at the university come f who comes from the Shannos dance tradition, which is completely improvisational. Quite often they make up their own material based on what their teachers are given them. And the ones I've been lucky to work with, they do not necessarily follow a script. They understand the movements and how it sits inside the music they're dancing to and then they take it from there. Uh, so when they were coming into class with me and we were going to work on a Scottish solo dance or on a Cape Breton uh, style routine just to give them, uh, you know, increase the knowledge of uh, dance vocabulary, there were a couple of things that struck me. A, how different uh, the Irish hear the music where the emphasized beats are and the main beats are. Uh, even though the movements themselves are very similar to what you might do in Cape Breton, but it's like a half a beat out from one another. So you can do the steps to counting side by side and be identical, but when you fit it to the music, you're actually not in sync if you're doing it the Irish step or the Cape Breton step. So that was one thing of tuning their ears into the Cape Breton and tuning my ears into uh, how they would hear the Irish music and where the emphasis and main beats are. And then I was looking at how quickly they were picking up on the movement material. And the key to it was that they were very relaxed. They were not there to win a championship. They were there to learn dance material because they just learned, loved to move to the music. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And also that they didn't see any sort of barriers. They might find that the timing was different but that was just a part of the fun challenge to kind of fit the movements into that type of music um, and then feel that I can now dance on the beat and off the beat and et cetera, et cetera. So to them, it's just widening the, their repertoire of movement that they embody. So moving from there, I thought, hang on, they're playing their way. You know, if you ask them, do you practice, kind of say, no, I don't. But when you see them, if they're in the cafe or if they're in the <laughs> corridor or whatever, they're constantly doing steps. So uh, they're practicing all the time. They're just not conscious of it. It's just an ongoing process, you know, all the time. If there's a session in the pub, they, they will work on steps in their head or physically. And, you know, it's the same as in Cape Breton. It's an ongoing process all the time. You hear a good tune on the radio, so you do a step in the kitchen. It's, you know, that straightforward. The difference was working with the same material with those, come, those students coming from an Irish competitive background. They didn't have necessarily a reference point to the music unless they actually play an instrument themselves. Mm -hmm. then that's a different uh, thing altogether. But if they're just coming from a class where they learn to counting and it's all about winning medals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, when it came to offering them chance to meander and make up movements themselves or whatever, they were simply not ready. Uh, they couldn't take that step initially. Some of them have managed to bridge that gap and can now do both, which is great, and others are very reluctant to go there. They're kind of safe in the way that they have, they have been taught all along. But a couple of years ago, I was teaching in South Uist in the Scottish Hebrides at the annual summer school at Keolas. And it's a great week of mixing Cape Breton and uh, Scottish Highland Gaelic uh, music and song and dance. 
and uh, a lot of the emphasis on is on the Gaelic culture and the language uh, in that place and you're encouraged to use Gaelic phrases and what have you in your class but one thing that is great is that you always have a musician either a fiddler or a piper in your class when you're teaching and the two years I'm thinking of when I started exploring things was uh, when I was teaching step dancing rather than figure dances like quadrilles or square sets or scotch fours and scotch reels. Um, you know, I could go in and teach a whole bunch of steps. Um, that would probably satisfy some of them. But I was looking at the, the group of people coming to this week and they keep coming year after year. And what are they really looking for? They love to dance clearly, but not all of them are locked into the music to the extent and the potential that they have because they not, do not necessarily live in that environment. I'm thinking of one young girl who really her only exposure to being taught anything was this one week a year. The rest of the time is dancing in your bedroom to recorded music and making it up and hoping it's, it's working. So there's no regular square dance or no festivals, you know, none of these going on that is uh, kind of gives you a musical input and uh, your, makes your body aware of how the music really moves you. So I started playing around with, it was one morning and I had a, um, a Shawnee McIntyre was the piper and I just asked him to play reels. And when I'm saying reels, I'm talking uh, Gaelic, uh, push the bill, mouth music, uh, piping tradition of these tunes. So it's all Gaelic inspired flow in the music. And I just asked him to play, play, whatever. And I asked the class to walk in time with the music to begin with just as a kind of warm-up but it turned into something else i then asked them to do what you do tend to do in the cape Breton square sets uh when you're walking that you kind of slide your foot forward until you transfer the weight so you take your full body weight on it uh and then you have the body weight and then you slide the other one forward it's and when i say slide it's not scraping it it's just uh uh, a soft squishing so you gradually transfer the music and you can find a particular pulse in doing that so I encourage them all to walk around anywhere in the room go move backwards turn around whatever and because they're all dancers who have some knowledge in uh, this style of stepping I could then say just say stay on the spot and do a bunch of back steps or do a few basic steps or just copy me so I wouldn't say I would just do something and they had to follow me. What I found was that they were locking much deeper into the music. They were not worrying about getting the feet absolutely right, but they were because they were relaxing. And they were finding the energy points of where the hop in a, in a step, for example, should absolutely be. And when the transfer of energy is going from one foot to the other, or where the transfer of energy goes into the foot that's doing a shuffle forward and back. And all of a sudden they were in the flow of the music. And then I started just throwing new steps at them, which they normally would say, could you do that slowly and break down? Now I just threw it at them at full speed and they were not thinking about that this is new and this is complicated that we just copy. So I was speeding up the learning process and I have no idea how many steps I passed on to them, but I would say that I got through more material doing it this way than if I was going slowly and breaking it down mechanically with counting and then speeding it up. And it made me think of that this kind of playing around and getting their bodies and their minds inside the music that in itself helped them to speed up how they relaxed and how they energized the movements and how they found that they were actually responding to the music uh, in the flow uh, at a much quicker rate. So having tried it in the work uh, for the period, I decided uh, to apply this in the university context because if you go into you might have a big class of percussive dance so you might have 30 of them in the room different abilities and you go through more material and repertoire rather than working on small energizing points in dance and how it can fit to different parts of music and styles of tunes and what have you 
But when I went into the kind of one-to-one or two-to-one classes that we run, I started by doing the, the walking and certainly with the channels dancers, as a good example, they would just lock into it straight on. So you can move very quickly into doing steps and without breaking anything down, you just go at full, uh, full speed. Every now and again, they would say, just do that one again. And that's all they would say. They just need a confirmation that they are picking up the, the movement material. And then they start morphing it into their own bodies and doing stuff with it. And I don't have a, a problem with that. I want them to kind of do their own thing with it, but they also need to understand the style I'm trying to pass on as, as far as I can pass it on to them the way I have embodied it because I only dance as myself. But I find that that way of teaching has speeded up uh, movement vocabulary deeply inside the, the bodies and also by allowing them to work out what's going on without breaking it down for them, they have to experiment and go wrong until they get it right and they're dancing with you so you're all in sync. And to me, I find that it's embedded on a much deeper level in their bodies. So you don't have to go over the material again. You just go in and you pick up from where you left off the previous week. While we're in the big class where you break things down, half of them have not thought about the steps since the last class and they can't remember what they did. And you go back to square one or square 1.1 1. 1 and uh, start again. So I found that this way of, of teaching in the right circumstances and with the right people certainly speeds up uh, how much they take to themselves. And the ones who are not coming from that sort of relaxed way, when they start to relax and you kind of can capture them with that mode of teaching, you can see how the, the light bulb lights up and they go, ah, this is a different way of picking stuff up. And then you can move into all sorts of interesting choreographic directions and repertoire material. So I think that's my thoughts for well, you're for this reminding day. me of two thoughts, actually. Um, the one is when we learned step dancing, uh, we learned from a video, which was fine, except I knew nothing about what I was doing. Um, and so when we were introduced to the steps, um, we had all of the old patterns in us, especially as a Highland dancer, everything's turned out. So I had to take everything and take it straight forward, which was a battle in itself. But once you figured out how to uh, find that rhythm balance, it was much better. Um, and my realization at the time was, as a Highland dancer, you put your recording on the Highland Fling four step, and then you just dance to the beat. And I really actually didn't understand music until I came to Cape Breton step dance music. And then all of a sudden it was like, you have to know that fiddle tune because you have to know where the nuances are in the music to know how you would want to move that step through it. And that was a really interesting realization coming from where we were so regimented in our training. And then the other part- I uh, break in there and just say that yeah. exactly what I find with the competitive Irish dancers who are not musicians and the Shannon dancers who, you know, uh, all of the ones I know anyway are musicians as well. And it is that connection of being able to understand the music at such a deep level that you can make split second decisions that I'm going to go with the music or I'm going to play around with it with my body and do something against it to enhance it and create another layer of uh, sound with it. Uh, and because they have it already, you can move so much faster when you're working, but you can get the others there as well, but they need to start thinking out of, outside of their own box. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And um, we would, because we were living in Alberta at the time and didn't have musicians, we were by recording. So still in my head was still that you were following the beat of the music, really, until we came to a square dance. And then you have all this live music and you're picked up and the energy is going. And uh, the soloists, when they go up to showcase and, and we build up enough courage to go in and try to showcase. And the only step that would come out was the basic step because it was the only one I felt most comfortable in and the one my body could respond to the quickest. And then it was like, oh my goodness. And you'd come off and you go, but I have like 35 other steps I could have chosen. But the one the body recognized and performed the best was the one that was basic and, 
and most comfortable within the body. So it was really a quest for several years going back and forth between um, Alberta and Nova Scotia and um, trying to build up that repertoire enough where you embodied the movement so that when you did get up to solo, you could respond to the musician. And that is such a different way of working, but so much more comfortable within the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've had a similar journey written on so many times and being asked to go up and share my steps to the first number of times was I would say more mechanical and you did your little routine that you had uh, because otherwise you, you would just run out but gradually it just morphed into whatever the music told you whether it be a basic one or more complex step and certain steps wouldn't come out they just I can do them in the kitchen but it wouldn't come out in the hall until they were ready to come out at some point, all of a sudden, it just happened and you went, oh yeah, okay, obviously my body is now ready to, to do this one because the music triggered it and it's, it's actually the, the body decides before your mind has picked up on what you're uh, actually about to do. And when you reach that point and also I think musically that you're so used to tunes and the way certain melody lines go uh, that, you know, you hear the first couple of notes of, of a tune and you know, oh, it's, I know where this one's going. And all of a sudden there's loads of things that you can do that sits really well with that tune. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other thing there's, okay, there's one more in there, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you, um, when my daughter um, was little, so she would be sitting on a lap in our choreographies and um, we waited until she could walk and then she, she would run across the stage. But then as she started to figure out how to do those step dancing steps from watching us, she had her own little steps that she created with what she was capable of. And so we just worked our choreography around her and whatever steps she picked up, then that's what we would start to add in. And then she would just continue to build. And so I think that's one of the wonderful things about um, learning in the kitchen is just that, that freedom of figuring out what it means for you and then being able to take it and make it your own. So instead of saying to her, it's the wrong step, honey, go sit down, you're not ready. We just said, awesome, look at your standing, come and dance with us. And whatever the step was that came out, it was okay. So, mm -hmm. and my other, I thought was, with that. my other thought I was thinking of, we've talked about several times and that's the holding hands. And I know in workshops um, where we've formed a circle, these are lots of different workshops because in the healing world, we'll do that a lot of times too. Um, but holding the hand and then working together to gain a step, everybody picks it up very fast um, with that connection. And one of the things in the Cape Breton Square sets is you are always holding hands with the group and there's a synergy of energy that happens there. So I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to talk about in relation to that piece. Well, I've always kept in mind what um, Mary Janet MacDonald from uh, uh, Port Hood or Mabu originally uh, told me that she learned from her sister and her mother uh, to step dance in that fashion that they would just take her hands and channel, you know, the steps from their bodies through the hands into her and, you know, play around with the material. Um, and I always had that in mind when I was teaching step dance in Scottish uh, primary schools in particular. You, you're asked to come in and do 45, 50 minutes uh, from nothing. You know, they have never seen it. They have no idea what it is. Uh, and the way to kind of get them is to get them in a big circle, join hands, and you start walking in time to jig music, and then you start shuffling them. You don't say well, that it's going to be difficult or anything. You just say, copy me. And... It worked really well, you know, you all, you know, more of the youngsters got it really quickly that way than if you had them lined up and trying to break things down and, you know, it's just, in a way, it just gets boring. I was just playing around with material. So in a 45 minute session, I would get through some jig steps, some strut space steps, uh, a basic real step, you know, one or two variations and maybe um, a Scottish Cayley dance. And so they would get quite a bit out of it, but just playing around with it and this sort of connection. And I would purposely kind of look around the room very quickly and see who would be the, who would tend to look insecure or kind of, oh, I got 42 left feet. And I would just 
without making any uh, indication that I had picked up on a thing, just go and stand next to them, take their hand and uh, in the circle and, you know, give them a little bit of a, a feel or an energy from me into them. And uh, they would um, respond very favorably. No, but of course, then you have all the issues of how you interact with young people and uh, all of these things, you know, all the health and safety and the uh, ethical side of things. But I always keep in mind, I was doing a, um, a dance class once and um, the local chief of police actually came into the school uh, because he was a keen dancer himself and he wanted to see what I was doing in the schools because he knew I was around. So he observed the class. And then he said, I said afterwards, uh, how shall I deal with these new, you know, safety concepts? And I said, well, he said, you're doing just fine because it's your, your professional attitude and you are, uh, as I said, you are a professional you, it's, and it's your relationship with that group. You know, you just go in and you put the dancing first and uh, energize through. So he said, don't change what you're doing. So I just kept doing these things. It's changed now though, and now when we're going online, uh, we're finding other uh, obstacles because now we're not even in the same room anymore and how do you pass these things on? But when you have the chance, um, you, I will finish by saying that I think one of the uh, moments in my life when I really learned how Cape Breton step dance works was uh, I was over in October one year and I just had a, a, a knee, ex, knee accident and I was sitting in the Red Shoe pub and uh, Mary Janet and lots of other friends were there, Kinnan Beaton and Andrea Beaton were playing and it was just um, full on, as good as it, it gets. And they launched into a set of John Morris Rankin tunes that I just love and I could hardly walk at the time. And uh, Mary Janet said, you have to get up and dance. And I said, oh, dance, I can't even walk. And she said, well, you're going to dance through me. And, you know, she just got me up and she supported me. And I step danced. But I felt by holding her hands how she moved with the music and that kind of minute, the little hold and little speeding up, the kind of the flow that she have instinctively, I felt it. Uh, and it was absolutely amazing. And I've never looked back since because it gave me a much deeper understanding how someone from within the uh, tradition works, you know. Yeah. And uh, I will be, will forever be grateful to that because that was a magical moment. And yeah. I danced and I, you know, my body was doing things I didn't think it could do with my injury, but I could. So <laughs> it was great. That's what happens when the music comes on too, right? Because sometimes you can be as mm. tired as anything at the end of the day and then a good tune comes on and you just come to life. The frequency definitely shifts. So, yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing all the insights. I've, there's a lot that we've talked about across that whole piece. Um, but with my goals for, for this week and allowing uh, dancers um, a bit of time to recover and just feel comfortable with who they are and going forward with creating their new ideas, I hope this creates some ideas that they can think a little bit outside the box. And I know uh, with me teaching more online, the healing work that I do and the energy exchange work that I do is actually more powerful when I'm online than it is when I'm in person, which is amazing to think. But if we can think of dance in that term and be able to find the way that we can energetically connect online to be able to enhance what we're doing at home with our, our own practice, uh, our collective groups will be able to expand dance in a completely new way. So. So thanks for being a part of that. Well, thank you for having me. Interesting to discuss these matters. Anyway, thank you. Always.